everyone. Yeah, we just saw that uh, we were dealing with uh, fish, which are kind of in the middle of the food chain, but right on taking it to the very top of the food chain, killer whales. You guys all know what killer whales are, right? We call them orcas. Uh, okay, cool. So I'm almost done with my PhD. I'm submitting in the, this summer, actually, so pray for me because I'm about to be done. Uh, it's a long process, and I'm going to take you through some of it. Uh, so I'm gonna, especially going to show you how, uh, using just the fat of different killer whales, I was able to map their entire diet throughout the entire North Atlantic and Arctic Ocean. That's pretty cool. Uh, so I'm going to show you exactly how we did that. So studying marine mammals' diets is really important because they're at the very top of the food chain. So whenever they decide to eat a specific type, uh, type of prey, uh, and how much they're going to eat of this specific prey is going to have an impact on the entire food chain. So with climate change, for example, killer whales are relocating up north and uh, they might change our diets in the future. So we need a method to be able to quantify exactly what prey they eat and how much they eat in order to understand how they will impact our environments. So for example here, I'll show you how we study marine mammal diets in like more of a traditional manner. So we have uh, a drone footage here uh, of a predation event. So we see here in the uh, red, can't point, right? Uh, so we see in red, uh, there's a bit of blood because these two killer whales just killed a seal. And so they're about to eat it. And this type of event is really helpful because it told us that this population at some point in time ate a seal. So we know that maybe they eat seal on a regular basis. Uh, and that's pretty helpful for uh, ecologists like me. But this type of event is actually pretty rare because you need perfect conditions to be able to fly your drone. You need uh, the water to be clear, and that's kind of rare in the Arctic and in the North Atlantic in general. Uh, so it's kind of challenging almost on also in remote areas because you need access to the whales. And if they're hard to find, you're going to have a hard time uh, observing them. So it's really difficult to establish long-term diets based on only one event. Also, you'll notice that on the right side of my uh, slide, we have two killer whales that are a couple meters deep. We can't see what they're doing. They could be eating fish for all I know, but I have no idea because the water turbidity is kind of high in the Arctic. So for the past couple decades, uh, researchers have been focusing on ecological tracer, uh, uh, sorry, on stomach contents and scat analyses. So these involve looking at what's inside the stomach of a whale once it dies, or collecting whale poo and then doing a bunch of experiments on it, like looking at the DNA of the prey it ate. So that's really helpful as well for ecologists like me, and we're able to get a lot of information from those. But there are limitations as well, because to look at the inside of the stomach of my whale, I need the whale to be dead. And usually dead whales are not healthy whales. So I'm not going to get the full picture of a healthy population if I just look at the stomach. And I don't know if you realize how complicated it is to collect whale poo. It's pretty hard. You need the whale to be close to the boat. You need the whale to poo at the exact moment where you have your little net. And it's really, really tough to do that in tricky water conditions in the Arctic. So ecologists like me in the past couple decades have been focusing on what we call ecological tracers. So those are little chemical informations that we can measure from a tiny little sample. And I'll show you what it looks like. So here we have the back of the whale with a massive dorsal fin. And what we'll collect, and I'll show you in a couple of slides exactly how it looks like. We collect a little, uh, a little biopsy. It's about the size of uh, the first nipple <coughs> of my pinky, so it's very small. And uh, it contains the black part, which is the skin. And then a little piece of blubber, which is the fat that whales have right under their skin. So we collect those, and then we can extract a bunch of different chemicals in these biopsies, in those tiny little tissue samples. And we can measure a whole bunch of different chemicals and chemical ratios, and those will tell us exactly what the whales eat and how much they ate. And we'll also know if they're contaminated by like human pesticides and flame retardants, etc. So I focused most of my PhD uh, adventure on fatty acids. Fatty acids are just lipids, and whales need a lot of lipids because they live in really cold water and they need a lot of energy. And so I've been looking at these lipids, and they come, so they're called fatty acids, the simplest <coughs> type of lipid. And they come in all shapes and sizes, and based on their structure, they will have different functions, like keep the animal warm, 
or give it energy. What's pretty neat about fatty acids in general is that they transfer, some of them transfer from the food chain, so from the diet, directly to the fatty storage of the predator. So let's say my killer whale's been eating a herring. It will integrate the lipids from the herring into its own blubber. But if my killer whale ate a seal, a ring seal here, it will also integrate the lipids from the seals inside its own tissue. And so if I look at the fat of the killer whale, using a bunch of very complicated models, I will be able to know exactly what this whale ate. And so that's exactly what I did. And I'll show you how I did that exactly. So today I'm taking you to Iceland on the boat uh, where I was last year <laughs> collecting killer whale samples. It's pretty choppy footage because it's actually pretty hard to sample killer whales in Iceland because uh, I don't know if you've ever been to Iceland, but the waters are not very calm. Uh, and so what we do is that we aim a rifle at the killer whales uh, that have a little dart, and the dart has a modified tip that will take like a skin core on the whale. So it's kind of like a mosquito bite, because the whale is pretty big, and it collects only the size of my pink. Um, and so it looks like this once it ends up in our lab, and the pinkish part is the blubber, and that's the part I'm most interested in. And so we collected the largest samples of North Atlantic killer whales to date. We had almost 200 samples, and they came all the way from Norway to Iceland to Canada and even to the Canadian Arctic. So this was a huge international collaboration. And we also collected over 900 prey species. So those included fish, seal fat, uh, whale fat, any kind of prey that these killer whales might eat because I needed that information for my modeling later on. And so once I have these little, these little pieces of blubber, I need to extract all the chemicals. And I do that with super strong solvents like chloroform, for example. And then uh, it, it's a pretty complicated process. It takes about two days to extract 10 samples. And I had 200 killer whales and 900 prays. So that was a lot. Uh, and then once we have the extracts, we need to measure them in a complicated machine. Uh, on the right is called gas chromatogram. Then I need to integrate each little peak that represents one lipid for one individual, which is a lot of time. And then I end up with this massive wall of data. And this is kind of what science is like. So I always start uh, my journey with this big wall of data. And I need to spend months and months to try to organize it and make sense of it. And so I developed a model that basically takes all of this information and tells me exactly the percentage of different prey species that each killer whale ate. And so that's how we obtained this figure. So this figure is a recap of each population. And what we found out is that the killer whales in Norway, Iceland, the Faroe Islands, they eat a lot of herring, so a lot of fish. Uh, some of them do eat uh, porpoises and uh, seals as well. And then Greenlandic killer whales, they eat a lot of Arctic seals but some of them also eat mackerel. And then our Canadian killer whales in Eastern Canada, they eat a lot of baleen whales with some porpoises. And in uh, the Canadian Arctic, we have a lot of belugas and narwhals, as well as some ring seals. But what surprised us the most was not just this, it was the amount of variation that happens inside one population. And we detected some different patterns, and that's gonna be very important for the future. So I'll show you some examples. So in the Canadian Arctic, for example, each bar here is one individual and each color is a different uh, percentage of different species. So in the Canadian Arctic, we had about half of our individuals here in green that eat belugas and narwhals. They prefer belugas and narwhals. And the other half seems to prefer ring skills. We don't know yet exactly why, but that's part of like, the research for me in the future. I'm gonna try to answer, answer that question. In Greenland, we have a totally different pattern. Killer whales seem to like carp and hooded seals, but they also eat pretty much everything they can find. So that's an interesting uh, pattern, and it's important for the future ecologically. We know that these whales can't eat whatever they can find. And in Iceland, we get something completely different. Most of the killer whales eat herring, so they prefer fish. But some killer whales, they also add harbor porpoise and seals to their diets. So that's going to be important for us in the future because I do a lot of work in Iceland and we're going to try to see if they help, if they are more contaminated by pesticides because they feed on different things. 
So what it told us in terms of research that we, instead of focusing just on the populations in general, we really need to look at each individual because each individual may have a different diet. And if you want to understand the effect of killer whales on the food chain, you need to look at all the individuals. You can't just rely on the mean population. And so that's important for ecologists. So what is next for the project? Well, just like I said, I'm going to try to look at Canadian Arctic killer whales, and I'm going to try to see if there's an impact of climate change on their diets to try and see if they, they're changing their diets or not uh, based on climate change. And I'm going to try to see if uh, these whales are more contaminated. I'm currently writing the next chapter of my thesis, trying to finish pretty quick before the summer. And I can already tell you it's unpublished, so that's kind of a secret. Uh, but I'm here to tell you that Canadian killer whales are super, super contaminated by pesticides. And Canada really needs to step up and get rid of its pesticides because killer whales are being threatened right now. So that's kind of it for me. Thank you so much for your attention. And uh, you can... So if I could just ask you guys maybe to just give them one last sort of round of applause here. Because part of this all is like initiative and sort of engagement in science. Um, but what I will say is this is a very diverse group, a very diverse room that we have here, ladies. It's a uh, group of budding scientists and a group of budding social scientists as well, right? So there's very different perspective from the work that you guys are doing and maybe where some of those, the interests lie. Um, I've got a couple backup questions, but I'm going to throw it to the floor. Does, if anyone has a question, why? yeah, go ahead, Chelsea. Um, I was just wondering how you guys like chose the topic or like specifically what you were 